Lee Perez, thank you so much for joining us on Highest Aspirations. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. <clears throat> for sure. And first, I want to say on behalf of all of us at Elevation, uh, and particularly Dennis Ocampo, who introduced me to you, um, congratulations on being named the 2022 Nebraska Teacher of the Year. That's uh, such an amazing accomplishment. We'll get into it, but really, congratulations on behalf of all of us. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that as well. And yes, uh, meeting Dennis at mid TESOL was, was really cool. Uh, I got to talk to him for a while and we got to kind of uh, exchange uh, contact information and said, hey, uh, I need to connect you with my friend, Steve. We need to get you on the podcast. So yeah, I tell Dennis, hi. He was he was really, really fun to engage with. And again, it's a pleasure to be here. Good, good. Yeah, I just connected him like 10 minutes ago. I said, I'm about to interview because it's, it's been a long time coming because I know you've been busy, but he was excited. Um, and you have been busy since we spoke. It was last fall, it was October when we chatted. I guess we're we're recording this kind of in mid to the end of December now. It'll go out in January. Um, but I want to go back to that conversation um, that we had and revisit something that you said to me then. You mentioned that one of the reasons that you can kind of ran for Teacher of the Year was because immigrant populations in your area, you're in Omaha, um, specifically yeah. Afghan and Ukrainian populations were, were rising uh, in the city and in many of the suburbs as well. Yes. So I guess my question there is, what did you hope to accomplish um, with these students as Teacher of the Year? And and have your kind of hopes been addressed up to this point? We'll kind of frame the rest of our conversation around that. Yeah, well, a lot of them that are coming are, are uh, refugees. They're SLIFE students, which stands for Students with Limited Interrupted Formal Education. Uh, over the last couple of years, I've been getting a lot of um, students from Afghanistan. They are very, very sweet kids. Their families are very, very respectful. And they really, really appreciate the value of education, you know, specifically girls and young women. Because as you know, uh, in Afghanistan, during the era of the Taliban, under Taliban law and decree, you know, it was illegal for, and even, you know, life-threatening for, for young girls to get an education. So a lot of these students that come for me are, you know, I, I don't even think they've really even been in school before. And I, I have several right now and what's really, really enlightening is to see their English progress every day. Like, for example, I've been working with um, a young lady right now who I got in August who literally is illiterate in her native language, which is Darian Pashtu. And now she went from literally going from A to Z in the alphabet, you know, one by one. to now she's reading in complete sentences. And so that has just been amazing. But what I want teachers to know specifically in the Omaha area is that these families are here. They value education very much. They have really, really high aspirations. And, you know, just on a side note, I, I just want people listening to this podcast to understand that, like, some of the misinformation that goes around with a lot of these communities is kind of disheartening. And I just kind of want to make that clear. Like, for example, during my year as Nebraska Teacher of the Year, and it's almost over, but I'm going to continue to to advocate for English language learners and marginalized communities going forward, is that lots of people don't understand the difference between an immigrant and migrant and a refugee. Mm -hmm. And I will say lots of these students that are coming from Afghanistan are refugees. So just to be clear, immigrants and migrants, for the most part, choose to come to a country. Refugees, they don't have a choice. They're forced out. So I do want to say that these families were forced out due to traumatic um, experiences, specifically political destabilization and you know terrorism and, and threats of violence. So that's the one big thing I want people to understand with our Afghan population is their choices were stay and die or flee to another country where they had a plethora of opportunities for where their families could be safe and their education could thrive in a flourishing environment. So it's been an honor to serve them, and uh, I look forward to getting more in my classroom as the year progresses and going into 2023. Yeah, re really inspiring to hear that. I mean, I think, and I really appreciate that clarification, because I think that many of us, myself, and something I think deeply about, honestly, the definition of an immigrant versus a migrant versus a refugee. Yes. You know, it's and and it's it's enlightening to hear it from somebody who has spent a long time working with this particular group of students. Um. And, you know, that kind of leads me to my next question. In order for us as educators and systems to be able to support these students who uh, have really high aspirations and who value education, and thanks for bringing that up as well, and it's really important, Yes. Um, we, we need to make sure that teachers are qualified to serve those students and have the experience they need. And I know you feel really strongly about supplemental endorsements um, yes. in, in EL programs or multilingual learner, whatever 
you're not going to be using in your particular district or state. We, we share that sentiment here at Elevation, obviously. Um, we work as much as we can on kind of PD elements to make sure that that, that teachers are prepared. But in your view, are, t- are teachers more motivated to do this now than, say, five or 10 years ago? That's kind of question number one. And the second part of that question is, is do you feel that colleges and universities or any kind of higher ed institution uh, is able to accommodate this need in a way that provides access to teachers wishing to get that endorsement? Yes. And I would say yes. I, I would say that many teachers are more motivated to do that. Uh, my district does a lovely program where they use Title III, which is federal funding, to um, for teachers that want to add. In Nebraska, it is a supplemental endorsement, so it's five classes, it's 15 hours to add a ESL endorsement to their Nebraska teaching licensure. And I will say many teachers have taken up that opportunity. Uh, at my school, I know several that have done this. It's it's a free program through a local university, and it gives them the strategies to work with our multilingual learners in Nebraska. And it's funny you mentioned the acronyms. In Nebraska, we call it ESL. In some states, yeah. they call it ESL, ESOL. Some states, they call it TESOL. Some states, they call it ELL. Yeah, but yeah, I, I do see I do see an increased interest in that. And you know, for example, I had a colleague when I first got here at Buffett. She did the ESL endorsement program. Now she's teaching full time ESL down at another middle school in um, in the Bellevue, uh, Omaha area, and she's loving it. And I actually had a I actually had a conversation with a colleague today that says I just received my ESL endorsement last year from the program that you wanted me to go through. I'm thinking about being a full time ESL teacher. So yes, I do yeah. see an increased interest. And the reason why there's an increased increased interest is because there's more students coming into schools that are ESL and lots of teachers are getting them. And what I what I appreciate about my school is lots of teachers come to me and they they ask, you know, how do I work with a student like this or what supports can I provide or what um you know how can I differentiate, you know, linguistically to help this child be successful and you know how can I make this classroom more equitable for for ELLs. So yes, I do see an increase of interest. And I will say colleges and universities, I will say I think they can do better in Nebraska Mm -hmm. because lots of times, you know, in Omaha, we have such a big ELL population. It's not big in some of the rural parts, but the populations are getting bigger. You know, for example, when I did my research for Nebraska Teacher of the Year, when I interviewed I looked at a county in rural Nebraska where in 2019, 2020, they had zero English language learners. And then in 2021, 2022, they had 100. So they went from zero to 100 within the span of a year. So when I speak to colleges and universities and my uh, my primary audience is student teachers, I basically kind of go over language strategies. But the first question I ask is how many of you have English language learners in the classroom. And unanimously all the time, I'd say pretty much 99% of the room will raise their hand. Mm -hmm. So I will always try to market an ESL endorsement. You know, even even initial education majors and and teacher prep programs, I'll say, you know, it's 15 hours, it's five classes. You know, you can add it to your license. As a matter of fact, where I'm doing my master's now in TESOL, it's a university in Seward called Concordia. It's been absolutely fabulous and enlightening to me. Uh, Some of the... um, classes that I spoke to, some of the some of the uh, teacher candidates came up to me after I spoke and said, you know, I'm actually interested in pursuing an ESL endorsement after your speech. So being Nebraska Teacher of the Year has been a really good way to not only advocate for my students, but it's a good way to market an ESL endorsement for people that are interested in it. Because I always tell um, student teachers and education majors, regardless of what your curricular area is, you're going to have ELLs in your classroom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Be in math, they're going to be in science, they're going to be in social studies, they're going to be in English language arts, they're going to be in tech and living, human growth and development, physical education, PE, you name it, they will be in your classroom. So you might as well add that supplemental endorsement to give you the strategies to work with them. But also, if you decide you want to join the wonderful world of teaching ESL, you definitely have the credentials to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it's great. Thanks for uh for for kind of outlining that. And I think a couple of takeaways from what you said. First, I, I'm happy to pleased to hear that both the answers to that question seem to be yes. And I'm we're seeing yeah. that as well that that there is um uh an in, a more an increased interest in content teachers to get that supplemental endorsement, whatever it looks like, or at least to tra- to get themselves educated to work with with uh English learners. 
but also it it's not it it's no well i don't want to say it's no longer because maybe it never was but it's not a supply and demand thing i don't think i don't think it's like yes we we are seeing growth as you mentioned and the story that you told about the area outside the rural area outside of omaha is 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 one that's repeating all over the country we're seeing that everywhere yep, yep. so there certainly is a need but you also mentioned something else i think is really heartening and 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 quite true is that many teachers that when they get this endorsement and they begin working with students like the ones that you're describing become very interested, dedicated, and passionate about working with those students. And, you know, we talk on this podcast all the time about you got to take an asset-based approach. What are these students bringing in? Well, as soon as you begin working with students like this, you it's immediately apparent, right? It's like this nebulous thing that you don't really understand until you actually begin working with these students, it seems. Um, and so it's nice to hear that many of the teachers who are getting the endorsement are not only using it in their own classroom, but saying, you know what, let me let me dedicate more of my time or perhaps all of my time as an educator to work with this amazing group of students. Yeah. And I, I actually had a conversation with a colleague a week ago that is, a, is doing the ESL endorsement currently. They have an elementary cohort and they have a secondary cohort. And she's actually thinking about taking, she'll be done with that endorsement in May. It's an accelerated program. It's it's really intense, but it, I always tell people it's really worth it. It's just a lot of work because, you know, lots of these programs, specifically like the master's program I'm doing, what they're doing is they're taking 16 weeks of curriculum and they're condensing it into eight week programs. Yeah. And when you holistically look at the United States of America, lots of uh, colleges are shifting to online, you know, graduate programs where you can just, you know, you log in and you just, you do week by week modules and it's kind of awkward because I, I told my wife, you know, this is, <laughs> you know, I have two college degrees. I have an associate's degree and I have a bachelor's and now I'm working on my master's. And I go, this is the only time I've ever taken classes where I've never actually went to class where I just yeah. log in and do discussion boards and write papers and respond to posts and stuff like that. Uh, but I always tell them like, you know, it's super intense, but it's it's totally worth it. But I, I like the, uh, I like the, the fact that you know, it's an accelerated program and it gets people certified and it gets them into the field because, you know, as you know, you know, they're, they're coming and, and, and they're coming and they're, 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 spur, you know, they're, they're, it's kind of like this ELL direct, uh, um, this, you know, this disparate, um, what am I trying to say? Diaspora? Like, diaspora? Yeah, diaspora. Like diaspora. Yeah. yeah, that's, that I'm long... actually pretty, pretty impressed. That I was able to come up with that term, but yeah, so <laughs> like, long day. So this ELL diaspora that's going on and, um, you know, we need to get people certified and we need to get them certified fast. And I always tell people, you know, it's an accelerated program, but they're still teaching you the, the language skills you need to, to learn, to, to work with these students. And so I say, yeah, it's a lot of work and it's, a, it's, it's, it's intense, but it's totally worth it. And I'm still promoting that. And every year this, this district cohort is huge and they get literally hundreds of candidates that get their ESL certification through federal funding. And then many of them take that and they use that in the classroom. And that's awesome. So, yeah, great, great model to follow, I think. Um, and that's Omaha Public Schools, right? That's doing that. Yeah, Omaha yeah. Public Schools. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure there's information there in the website about what y'all are doing. And I think anybody who's listening and thinking about that, because not all districts have that kind of program. Yeah, building what them out. I will say is lots of districts in Nebraska are kind of like mirroring what Omaha Public yeah. Schools is doing. And they're starting to do those programs. I know uh, Grand Island Public Schools is starting to do that with a local university where they're getting um, ESL certifications in Grand Island, which I think is great because that's where my wife is from. So, yeah, lots of these other school districts are saying, hey, you know, Omaha Public Schools is doing this really, really awesome thing with ELL endorsements. We need to start doing the same thing because we're seeing increases in population. So, yeah, it's starting to be like this language domino effect of, oh, we need to start doing this. We need to start getting people certified because sure. we're we're seeing a need in our district. <clears throat> yeah, I mean that's great. Why not? Why reinvent the wheel when something's working somewhere? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's. Say, I want to stick with the kind of education, teacher education, professional learning piece for a minute because we're talking uh, a lot about kind of pre serve I mean, it's some some of it's in service because you're doing it while you're teaching. But what what about well, one thing we focus a lot on here is um is ongoing professional development. What do you think the role um, that professional development or professional learning has in ensuring that all teachers are prepared to work with diverse populations of English learners, particularly as needs change um, over time and just and programs change and you know demographics change? Have you experienced high quality programs? Have you seen them? What do you, what's working for you? What would you kind of um, 
pitch if you if you had to? Yeah, so I would say the, the ESL endorsement program was was high quality PD. Uh, the TESOL Masters that I'm doing right now is high quality PD. But what I would like to see more of is I would like to see like our state and our district push out more of that either monthly or bi-monthly. And I know people are busy and I know things are, you know, I know things in this country are, are kind of, uh, we're still recovering from COVID obviously. And, you know, there's a teacher shortage, but I would really, really like to see PD centered around English language learning because truthfully, I'm not seeing a whole lot of that right now. And so at, um, whether you're aware of this or not, I was the first ESL teacher to win Nebraska. I was, and it, so I was since it's so excited about it. In 52, it gets pretty much the reason I ran because I wanted to see uh, a change in that. And I also wanted to advocate for um, this community of multilingual learners. But one of the things I'm seeing when I give my speeches, professional development in my workshop presentations is that, you know, there's just so much misinformation and disinformation and just, you know, just flat out myths about how language is learned. You know, for example, people will come up to me and say, well, um, how do you communicate with these students when they, do you, you know, do you speak 40 languages? No, I don't, you know, you don't have to be, you know, bilingual or multilingual to be an ESL teacher. It helps, but you don't have to be, or they'll come up to me and they'll say, well, um, how did these kids do their work? You know, did, you know, do, do you let them speak their native language in there? Or is it English only? So sometimes you'll have like this bias of, well, you know, they, if, if you're teaching them English, they probably shouldn't be speaking their native language, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, actually, that's, that's false. You know, you know, language research shows that L1 supports L2 and everything like that. So it's just, I think teachers need more PD because there's just a lot of language myths that are going around that need to be addressed. And, you know, oftentimes when I, when I tell students, um, you know, that are in education programs, Oh, oh, so you don't have to speak all these languages to be an ESL teacher? No. And then they're like, oh, well, I, I might reconsider then yeah. actually adding the endorsement. And I'm like, so yeah, it's been really, and I'm asked that I, I, every single university I've went to in Nebraska, they've asked me that question and I'm always prepared for it. So it, it's just amazing to see the, like the eyes go up because it's like, wow, like I didn't know that. And it's like, yeah. And so my advocacy has been powerful. And so I'm really, really pushing teacher prep programs here to prepare their students more to work with multilingual learners. Like another exercise I do is, you know, oftentimes in America, we are, well, you know, we're in it. Let's be honest. We're an individualistic culture. We are. Mm -hmm. Look yep. how the United States handled COVID. We just didn't handle it very well. We looked at it from a very selfish perspective. And I remember uh, at when, when COVID first happened, I had a student from Japan. And I remember the mother emailed me during the pandemic and she said, uh, I don't feel safe here. Um, we are going back to Japan. And as you know, Japan is a collectivist culture. And Japan was one of the few countries that was actually able to get COVID under control because they viewed it from a collectivist mentality. But it's interesting because that mother would say to me, you know, I, I don't understand why Americans are acting the way they are in regards towards science and math. And she said, you know, in Japan, in Japanese culture, it is custom and respectful, even before COVID, if you were sick to wear a mask. And so when you look at the data from Japan, they were actually able to get this thing under control because people had that collectivist mindset mm -hmm. of they were going to work together as a group to get this thing under control. And I told the mother, I go, I completely understand. And so it's just one of the things I do is you know, lots of times teachers don't know how to work with English language learners, so they get frustrated. So one of the exercises I do when I when I go speak is I call up a volunteer and I ask them this very simple question. I say, I want you to read what I'm going to put on the board. And they're like, oh, okay, this is easy. I can do that. Sure. So I, I'll put it up in two languages. And the languages I, I will use is Russian and um, Arabic. And so I put it up and then they can't read it. And so then I pretend like I'm a, just a really mean teacher. And I'm like, why aren't you following directions? Why aren't you listening to me? And some of them turn red and they start to sweat and they get uncomfortable. And so then I have them sit down and I said, what I just taught you was perspective. So now imagine a kid's come to your classroom and they see that. And imagine if a teacher's being mean and intolerant to them. And I said, did that make you feel uncomfortable? And they said, oh yeah, it made me feel extremely uncomfortable. So I want you to remember that. 
when you get an ELL in your classroom, mm -hmm. because I want you to remember how you felt, because now I just taught you something. I taught you perspective, because unfortunately in this country, you have to experience something to care. So now that I made you feel uncomfortable and I made your classmates feel uncomfortable, when you get an English language learner in your classroom, I want you to remember that exercise that I taught you, because that's how they feel. They're scared. Yeah. They're uncertain. And all of a sudden then teachers that don't, you know, you're just super, super mean. And so they'll always say, well, how do you know kids don't speak English? I'm like, it's easy when you talk to them and then they have a big smile. A <laughs> smile, is, smile is a universal way is I don't know what you're saying. But I always, I always end that, that part of my speeches with, they don't know how to read that yet. And the yet is the important word. They will eventually yeah. learn how to read that. And so then I go into like the, you know, like, you know, Krashen's theory, Crawford's theory, you know, how, how language works and how, you know, yeah, the research says seven to 10 years to acquire language. And yeah, and it's just really eye opening to them. And I always tell, you know, in some of my audiences, there's deans, there's co-chairs of teacher education departments, there's teacher ed professors. I said, teach your candidates this exercise. Yeah. Yeah. That, or they go in the field that way they know. And they're just like, wow, that's, that's, I've never looked at it from a lens like that. But yeah, it's a lens of, oh, I made you feel uncomfortable. So now that you know how that feels like, remember that when it happens to you, because it will, you will get a kid in your classroom that doesn't speak English right? and scared. And you have to remember that. So, you know, I, you, you sort of answered my next question here, which is great, man. I know you've done, you, when we talked in October, you said you're on track to do over 50 speeches and, and go to lots of places. And it sounds like you're speaking with a wide variety of stakeholders. And what I like about what you do, like a lot of things about what we just said, but you know, at the end, you talked about how you bring the research after, but you're, you're, you're giving people a moment where it's an acute moment of emotional distress that is going to kind of break through that. I think you call it the individualistic kind of outlook that we have and give them an experience that they need to understand it. But then bringing in that research as well is going to really bring in everybody who needs to be involved. So no matter who you're speaking with, I always talk about, I have a couple of degrees myself. I, I had, I spent about a year at, at, at Harvard, at Harvard Graduate School of Education as somebody who was a high school teacher for 17 years. And I called BS on a million different things that they said. I said that what you're talking about would never work in the classroom. That research is great, but that researcher needs to go to a classroom and do exactly what you just talked about. So the value that you bring from having that research perspective and having the, the, the practical perspective and bringing those together in a very sort of experiential way I think is so valuable. And it, my second kind of takeaway here is it breaks down a lot of the things that you're talking about, which is the misconceptions, the relics from the English only past that people through sometimes no fault of their own, just, just, they assume that of course, like you just speak English, like it's sink or swim. Um, you know, that's what, that's what I did, or that's what my parents did when they're immigrants from wherever, but the research shows it's the complete, it's the complete opposite of that, but you're not going to convince anybody. Well, you're not going to convince most people by just saying the research shows you got to give them an experience. So that's great. It's, it's one of those things where you got, you got to, you, you can take research, but you can show people human emotion too, you know, because, you know, you, you can state, you know, I, I could easily just say research says seven to 10 years, but you know, that's like a lecture, but to right. actually get a candidate up there and make them feel uncomfortable, make them feel scared, make them feel uneasy, make them feel uncertain. You know, that's the point because, because, because then only then can they, can they in a way semi empathize. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say empathy. Yep. And then that's to say you can take human emotion and you can combine that with research and say, okay, now you felt this way. This is what the research says. And, and by the way, like on the English only movements, I will say this, and this is another thing I give in my speeches, you know, lots of people talk about the constitution and I will say the constitution is a sacred document, but one thing the founders did back at the constitutional convention after the American revolution is the founders actually debated the notion of an official language. They actually debated whether English should be the official language. And even the founders themselves, with a few dissenters like John Adams, even decided that English should not be the official language of this country. Monoling monolingualism, in a sense, was not a prosperous path forward mm -hmm. to an American nation that would thrive as a constitutional republic. And so... For example, like many of the documents that the Continental um, the Continental Army translated were in two languages, primarily German and French. 
So I always explain to uh, education majors and student teachers. So if they were translated in those two primary European languages, you had French and German speakers that fought on the Continental Army during the American Revolution. In other words, they died to, to, to basically found this country. And so when you look at the history of this country, you had multilinguals fight for independence of this country from England. And mm -hmm. so when you look at that, you know, George Washington was one of the few monolinguals. You know, John Adams was a uh, multilingual. Benjamin uh, Franklin, our, our um, very, very social um, diplomat to the United States, was multilingual. George Washington, our first president, was monolingual, but he even he said that no, even though English is a predominantly spoken language, the official language should not be English. So even back to the very founding of this country, this issue of English only was debated, and the founders said no. They yeah. said no way. Yeah. It's not. It's not the way forward. So a little little constitutional language history for for, for people, and those those are just the facts right there. Yeah. Like, powerful the way that you interweave all those things <laughs> if, if 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 research and experience isn't going to work here's a history lesson for you exactly um, yes <laughs> yeah yes because yeah. all the time I, i'm hearing people refer to the constitution well if you're going to refer to the constitution universally then you can't just cherry pick the bit, bits and pieces that right. you want to use to say oh this is the, how the united states wants to be but a lot of these people that are pushing these english only initiatives i will say that the founders of this country what history teaches us is they would adamantly have disagreed with you. Yeah. And that's a fact. Interesting. That's amazing. Thanks for that. that was, it's, it's so well put um, and connecting the dots on such a variety of different things. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit to talk about a few, a few issues that, that you've said are particularly important to you. And they're also particularly important to us. So I want to get your perspective on them. Sure. Um, one is is using data to make informed decisions about ELs, which we hear all the time. I, I like to talk about it as kind of going beyond compliance. As someone, you know, who did some training for Elevation, our products back in the day, the, uh, back in the day, it was like five years ago. Um, people were very concerned with checking off boxes that monitoring forms were filled out. When we got our parent letters out, and we were in compliance. And I would always try to educate people, if need be, that it's not about compliance. It, it is. You have to check the boxes. But it's also about making sure that the students have the support that they need and that the teachers have input and that we can make sure we're making the right decisions so students can reclassify or whatever the case may be. So there's that. There's data-informed decisions. And then there's EL strategies in mainstream classes, which we've talked a little bit about through like this, the idea of professional development. I want to ask you about those two things together because they're yeah. maybe separate issues, but they're also they can go together in a variety of different ways. So I'm going to just kind of throw that at you and you can take it. Clearly, you can kind of put the pieces together. No problem at all. So I'll kind of let you free form those two and let me know why you think those two are so crucially important and what you think teachers need to be doing to kind of link those together. Right. Well, I will say this. ELL strategies are strategies that are good for all kids. They're good yep. for ELLs. They're good for SPED. They're good for how high ability learners. Oftentimes we forget they need needs too. Just because they're high ability, they still need needs met every day. And they're just good for all students. You know, every student can benefit from data informed instruction. Every student can benefit from graphic organizers, Venn diagrams, pictures, um, kinesthetic learning. Uh, all students can benefit from sentence frames and sentence stems. All students can uh, benefit from honing skills in reading, writing, speaking, and listening, which are the four domains of language acquisition. So I always tell people when I when I do my speeches that these these strategies are good for all kids, including English language learners. It's just with ELLs, sometimes you have to linguistically scaffold them to make them more equitable for our language learners. But I'm going to break this up into two parts. So driving data to um, 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 inform instruction moving forward. So, I mean, honestly, uh, data is it, it, sometimes it can be dull and boring. It, it's just not, it's sometimes data is just dry. And lots of times when I would go to meetings in the past, you know, people would go, oh man, we got to talk about data today. But what I do is I teach my students accountability through data. And so when I do these, when I do this workshop presentation, I always tell teachers who is taking the test, you or your students. And they say, well, our students. So instead of you, you know, crunching numbers and trying to be some, you know, mathematician, you know, mathematician, you know, kind of like a goodwill hunting, doing equations on the wall or something like that. Teach your students how to use this data to set goals. And they're like, well, how do you do that? So in other words, put the accountability in their hands. So when we prepare for our English language proficiency assessment, 
for the 21st century. We, we do Elpa 21 in Nebraska. Yep. Do, you, do you guys do WIDA or Elpa 21? Well, we, we, everybody. So we have WIDA, Elpa 21, California, oh, New York, yeah. everybody. Yeah. The whole yeah, thing. It's, I mean, I'm familiar I with all. Said, yeah. Tomato, tomato. It's the same thing. Yeah. So, so uh, I will say this, uh, when I'm preparing them for that test, we look at data. And so what I do is I have, I teach my students how to read data through bar graphs. So what I do is I do a, well, let me show you. Um, so like, if this is like their reading scores, okay. So if this is reading and they would do this for all of it. So basically what they would do is simply this, you know, they are scored from zero to five, obviously, um, if they get a four or five, they are proficient in advance and they exit the program. So basically what I do is I look at Alpha 21. So they'll graph that to five. That's the highest one. Then they'll look at last year. So say they scored a two, then they'll graph that. And then I have them set a goal moving forward. So say, I'll say, you know, okay, you're at a two. Let's try to move you up to say a three or a four. And so then what I do is I teach them how to read that data. I teach them why it's important. So I say, okay, this is the highest you can get. This is where you are last year. This is where you need to be. And I teach them how to read these graphs. So we do student-led conferences at our school. So when their parents come, they take that data and they literally yeah. explain to their parents what that data means and why it's important. So in other words, lots of kids have said to me in the past, I don't, I, I always ask my students this question. How many of you understand the rationale or the reason why you take these tests? And many of them don't know why they take it. Some yep. of them say, well, I take it because my teacher said that the state says I have to. And I always say, no, don't tell your students that. You have to, you have to understand that you have to sell this test to your kids. You can't just say, oh, you're, you have to do it because I say so, or oh, you have to do it because the district mandates it, or you have to do it because the state says that you have to comply with uh, you know, certain check marks for federal funding. You can't tell kids that because it's irrelevant. They don't care. You have to put it in a way that makes them care. So a way I put it is I say, in my program, if you graduate ESL, you exit ESL, it's like graduating high school. We celebrate it. I get you a certificate. We have a pizza party. It's, it's a mile so. And so I teach my students this data so that when they go into this test, they know what the highest score is, where they were last year, and where they need to be. And so it works. I mean, the first year I got here, the first year I got here, I was able to exit 42% of my students. So over half my class. Yep, it's amazing. And it was a 31% increase from the teacher that I took over for. But the reason why it was so high is because I taught them accountability through data. We set goals. We talked about the data. We talked about the goals. And I just made it relevant to their lives. I just said, you know, this is how reading can be useful if you want to be a doctor, which some of my kids do. This is how writing can be applicable if you want to be a small business owner, which is something that is applicable to do. I teach them how these skills can transcend their education outside of ESL. And it's powerful. Yep. And that's one of the work. And one of the, so in OPS, we use um, the SIOP model. So we use um, language, we use um, content objectives and language objectives. But one thing I want to pilot starting next year is called um, RWOs. And that stands for real world objectives. And real world objectives would basically be an objective to where students would be able to apply this skill outside of school. Because if you can teach students why the skill is applicable to their lives and their careers moving forward, you're going to get more engagement. You're going to get more, kids are going to buy into it. More. Sure. Yep. You can't tell kids, I mean, it's a test, it's not fun, but you can't just tell kids, well, you have to do it because we're mandated to do it. They don't care about that. You have to sell it to them. You do in a way as an, as a teacher, you, you have to be a good salesperson. You do. Mm -hmm. Oh, hundred percent. You can't sell this stuff to them. Then they're not going to care. And so yep. I've been able to do that really well over the last couple of years. And my program has seen a, ex, you know, an exceptional exit rate and it's working pretty well. And I have a high amount of kids this year that I expect to get out, but I teach them why the data is important, what to do with the data and how it's going to help them exit this program and use these skills in their lives. Yeah. And I would add, you're also teaching them how to look at a graph and how to analyze data yes. and how to yeah. set goals using data. You started yeah. off by saying, and I totally agree with you that you walk into a PD when it's about data and half the people are like, Oh my God, but it's when you big, make, it's a big eye roll, but I exactly. 
say, teach these kids how to read it and how to disseminate it. And how to do something with it, how to make it powerful, how and to make they it. Are, they are taking the test. But if you can't sell it to these kids as to why they are taking this test, then it's completely worthless. And I always tell teachers like, but this is this is something you can do with any state test, not just with Elba 21 or WIDA. It can be the state writing test, the state science test, the state math test. I mean, data is not bad when you know what to do with it. Yeah. And you put know, it in the hands of our kids. Like I'm I'm making in my head, I'm making a connection. As I said, I taught high school for 17 years. And I taught high school Spanish and I had the I taught every level, but I had the privilege of teaching AP Spanish language and AP Spanish literature, right? And so these are pretty motivated kids that yeah. take these courses. Although, you know, there were a lot of kids who I sort of convinced to take it because I felt like it should be available to everybody. And there is a bit of salesmanship when it comes to that test as well. Like it's a test. People are, it's a busy season, but I used to do something very, very similar. And most of my students were not, uh, some of them were, were English learners and they were per highly proficient in Spanish, but most of them were monolingual learning Spanish in school. Um, and it was still such a valuable thing to have ownership over it. See, this is, you know, this is where you are now. We just took this practice test and you, you almost feel as a teacher, or I will speak for myself. I almost felt like, like a little bit sort of dirty, like talking about the value of a test to a student because you want to be that kind of like, well, you know, tests aren't everything. At least that's how I was, but there is a huge value in having them understand the purpose of it to get them to the next place they need to get to. Also, AP tests tended to be like fairly, I would say on the, uh, how tests work, fairly good measures and tests. Um, they do a lot of good work putting them together um, for yeah. what they were. So well, maybe not as difficult for me, but same process. So we're, again, like you said, what works for English learners works for all students. This is the same thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's just, you have to just teach them how to take the data and use it to set goals. And it's, it, it works really, really well. And it also involves the use of visuals, which is good for ESL, but it's also good for all kids because kids are able to see, oh, wow, geez. Oh my gosh, Mr. Perez, look, I'm at a three in writing. If I get to a four, I, I pass writing, right? Yes, you do. And it's powerful. And so on the second part of that, which is which strategies for that are good for all students is, yeah, I just... I always tell teachers all the time, you know, I use Venn diagrams with ESL students, but Venn diagrams can also be good for any content area classroom. Uh, one big strategy that I use a lot that's really, really good and it's cross-curricular, and you can do it with anything, is sketch notes. And those things are awesome. And it's a really, really fun, creative, engaging way for kids to take notes. It's not, you know, one of those big, like, oh man, we got to take notes. I'm going to I'm just going to start snoozing like kids really get into it. it. It involves writing. It involves creativity. It involves imagination. It involves pictures and visuals. And you can do it in anything. I tell social studies uh, majors, oh, you can do a sketch note on the Civil War or the Industrial Revolution. Science majors, you can do a sketch notes on the human body or the different, um, you know, chemicals on the periodic table of the elements. Uh, English language arts teachers, you can do a sketch note on, you know, novels you know romeo and juliet the odyssey uh, oh what's the other one uh math you can do sketch notes on equations and yep. different types of formulas you you can do sketch notes with literally anything and so i'm constantly pushing out these strategies that are you know all content they're they're good for all content they're good for all kids but yeah it's it's one of those things where um that's how i really sell the esl endorsement is hey this, when you take these classes, you're getting strategies that are not just good for ELLs. It's making you a bit better teacher in your content to use these strategies with all kids. And that's Definitely. another point I use for an ESL endorsement. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and we hear that all the time, you know, good strategy for English learners, good strategy for everyone. And it is definitely 100% true. And you laid out some really great examples there. Uh, Lee, I know that um, it's snowing a little bit there and it's getting late for you. So I, I want to wrap this up in a minute. So let me ask you two more questions. Okay. Um, the first one is I know your your kind of your year of service is coming to an end. We're recording this in December. By the time this goes out, it'll be 2023. I'm curious, number one, how can people learn more about the work that you're doing um, and some of these strategies that you're talking about? And then kind of in there, if you can just kind of indicate what I mean, what what's next for you? You've done had this amazing year. Clearly you're gonna continue advocating. Yeah. So uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My hashtag is at language Perez. Uh, I also have a website and I will actually share that with you so you can put it together with your written blog. 
Uh, moving forward, yeah, I definitely want to continue my advocacy. I don't know if you are aware, but I am a 2023 Horace Mann Awards for Teaching Excellence finalist. Congratulations the, again. Uh, yeah, I'm a finalist. Again, uh, made history of that. First person from Nebraska to ever be a finalist for that award. Uh, I've been told it's one of education's highest honors. I People say it's like the Heisman Trophy of public school education. So me and four other finalists are... Um, we uh, interviewed for the nation's top honor, which is the National Education Association's Award for Teaching Excellence. So I will find out May 5th of 2023 in Washington, D.C. at a gala if I got that. And if I did, um, I would be the obviously I'd be the first from Nebraska. But regardless of what happens, I have four amazing finalists. Um, two of them are actually state teachers of the year with me. Uh, Stephanie Ballard from uh, South Dakota and um, Teresa from New Jersey. Both, both incredible teachers, but the other two finalists, um, Kevin and Natalie, uh, Kevin's from Pennsylvania, Natalie's from Kansas, both phenomenal. I've read up on them. So regardless of who gets it, you know, we're all winners and it's just been an honor, but yeah, it's, it's been a whirlwind of just really, really a lot of good things happening in my life and a lot of recognition. And I just want to take, I just want to continue to take this recognition to use it as a platform to be a voice sometimes for students and families and communities that don't have a voice. And, uh, you know, if I have to take that megaphone and be a voice, I am, it, it's, it's truly an honor. So yeah, that's, that's me moving forward, uh, finishing my master's in TESOL. Uh, I would like to next year kind of get my hand into some adjunct work with TESOL and uh, ESL. I've had several local universities offer me positions of teaching ESL endorsement or TESOL courses. So in addition to my teaching duties, I'm looking forward to doing that as well. I can't think of a better way to kind of help spread the word. You're doing it yes. already. I mean, there's better yes. to be at the, on the ground doing that. Clearly, you're working with a lot of teachers, and you can hear in your voice the passion that you have for mentoring uh, teachers who are, who are coming into the field. And that's I think it's what we need. And, um, you know, I, I can't imagine somebody better to do it based on our brief conversations. And what a great thing to be involved with uh, those four other final or three other finalists. Or say three or four. Sorry, I want to make it's sure. Four. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's four. Yeah, you have a whole kind of uh, end up end up with quite a network there of pretty amazing folks. Um, so, last question before I let you go, it's a question we ask everybody who comes on the podcast. We have a whole kind of collection of books and resources from this, and so it's an important question. Is there a book or a film or another resource uh, that's had an important influence on you, either personally or professionally, that you'd like to share? Yeah, the book is called "One Classroom, Many Worlds." It's like a cross curricular um, guide for working with um, students from different linguistic and cultural backgrounds. It's by uh, an author named J.B. Clayton, uh, 2003. I actually read the book uh, when I took my language and culture class. That was one of the classes that I took for the ESL endorsement. But it's just a really, every now and then I just go back and read certain chapters. It's just a really, really good, as a matter of fact, in this last class I, I ended, I actually cited that book a lot in my research papers, my journal article reviews, my discussion boards. It's just a really, really good book, and it just kind of gives teachers a lens of what it's like to have students that are from different cultures and speak different languages, because I explain all the time, the language and culture are not an exclusive phenomenon. They're very much an inclusive phenomenon. They are one and the same. So when you have students from different backgrounds, language and culture are very much the same, and it just gives really, really good tips. It gives really, really good research. And also it gives really, really good personal stories and testimonies from teachers that have had students from various backgrounds. So One Classroom, Many Worlds by J.B. Clayton, 2003, definitely recommended for a really, really good read. Excellent. And in the 200-ish, I think, episodes that I've done of this, we have, I don't think we've heard of that one. So that's a new one. So that's great. We will uh, link to it uh, so folks can can take a look at it. I will also take a look at it. Uh, and Lee, with that, um, congratulations on everything and all your success. Um, I appreciate both your humility and your kind of easy way of going through everything. You have a way of really connecting things that are kind of complicated in a simplified way. And I think that that will serve you and everybody who works with you very well uh, as you move forward. I hope we can keep in touch and uh, get Ooh, home yeah. safe. Okay. Be careful in the snow there. <laughs>